Hi, uh, my name is Craig Haney and I'm speaking to you today from Santa Cruz, California. Um, I wanna begin uh, my presentation by thanking Richard and Michael for the gracious invitation to participate um, in this uh, esteemed international conference. Um, and I also wanna thank the, uh, the uh, Thomas Jefferson University for um, their assistance in organizing and sponsoring this conference. I want to uh, devote my uh, uh, 20 minutes to uh, talking you through uh, an article which I recently published entitled The Science of Solitary Confinement, uh, Expanding the Harmfulness Narrative. It's an article that was published in the Northwestern University Law Review, uh, volume 115, the first issue of which is devoted entirely to the topic of solitary confinement. And in fact, several of the participants in this international conference have articles in, in that special issue. Um, in addition to the Science of Solitary article that I'm gonna talk about today, I draw your attention also to a consensus statement that's published in that same journal issue. Um, a consensus statement from the Santa Cruz Summit on Solitary Confinement and Health held in 2018 in Santa Cruz, California, organized by myself, my colleagues at the University of San Francisco Medical School, Bree Williams and Cyrus Ahalt. Uh, and we brought together uh, a large group of international scholars, people who were experts in psychology, psychiatry and medicine and public health, in human rights, uh, in law related issues and in corrections people from all around the world. And we spent two days together talking about what was known at least uh, in 2018 about the effects and the consequences and the harmfulness of solitary confinement. And at the end of that conference, we collectively articulated a series of principles or policy recommendations, um, which we thought the future use of solitary confinement should be governed by. These are principles or policy recommendations that are designed to drastically reduce and perhaps eventually eliminate the use of solitary confinement, not just in the United States, but worldwide. Um, and I recommend that, um, that article to you as well. Um, some of the people participating in this conference, of course, were participants uh, in the Santa Cruz uh, summit as, as well. So it's, a, it's an interesting statement of the, of the state of, of of knowledge about uh, solitary confinement uh, and the status of solitary confinement in correctional systems around the world. Um, I wanna uh, really talk about just four things today and make four uh, basic points. Um, uh, four basic points about what I suggest here are the four ways that the harmfulness narrative that surrounds solitary confinement should, in my opinion, be expanded. These are things that we don't ordinarily talk about or think about when we acknowledge the consequences and harmfulness and damage that's done by solitary confinement, but I think uh, indeed really really should be should be given uh, more uh, significant attention and focus in discussions about why solitary confinement needs to be, as I said, uh, drastically reduced if not eliminated in correctional systems around the world. The first is a broad point about the nature of solitary confinement research. Um, and as I've said here, it is not a, a sui generis. That is to say, um, it is not some uh, kind of exotic area of study uh, unto itself. Um, that it is not related to a much broader literature, a much broader scientific literature that exists on the harmfulness of isolation and loneliness. It is in fact, instead a subset of that much larger literature. And so when you hear people say, as oftentimes defenders of solitary confinement do, uh, that more research is needed. Of course, more research is needed. More research is always needed on any topic. But it is not the case, first of all, that we don't have very much research on solitary confinement per se. We have a vast amount of it. Uh, people who argue that the literature is incomplete or undeveloped, I think, are oftentimes uh, not aware of the large literature that does exist on solitary confinement per se. But however large that literature is, it is dwarfed by a much larger and equally relevant literature. Literature which is done on the effects of isolation, social exclusion and loneliness in the larger society. Uh, people in the free world who are subject to isolation are damaged by it. 
People in the free world who are subject to social exclusion are damaged by it. People who are lonely in the larger society are damaged by that loneliness. And when we talk about solitary confinement, I think we need always to put it in the context of that larger scientific literature. Now, it's hard for me in a 20 minute talk to summarize what that literature looks like and all of the details. The article that I cited earlier, which I'm more than happy to send you copies of, really goes through that larger research in, 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 in much greater detail than I can, in, can I can in this brief talk. But just to underscore for you how much has been written about this topic, uh, not only are there countless articles, but there are numerous books, in fact, which bring together and synthesize the existing scientific knowledge. Knowledge about the harmful effects of isolation, social exclusion, and loneliness studied in much more benign environments than solitary confinement. Um, and in fact, it's not just in academic treatments of this, but it is now the case that the media understands the degree to which isolation, the, the degree to which social exclusion um, has a damaging effect on people's health and well-being. The New York Times just last week characterized social isolation as a slow killer, um, arguing that the, the damage of solitude is being overlooked. Um, and in fact, in particular places, in particular kinds of institutions, mostly nursing home facilities, um, it is important to now, as they say here, confront a growing physical and mental toll that social isolation takes. Even as the pandemic requires us all to socially isolate, it is important to take into account the fact that that social isolation comes at a particular price. In addition, uh, we know from scientific studies that um, uh, it, the risk to mortality that social isolation presents is equivalent to that of cigarette smoking. Uh, this is from a 2010 meta-analytic review showing that if you compare mortality that results from exposure to social isolation, it is as damaging to one's longevity uh, as having uh, been a cigarette smoker. The National Academy of Sciences it concluded 10 years later much the same thing, that the negative health consequences of social isolation, in their words, may be comparable or greater than other well-established risk factors such as smoking, obesity, and physical inactivity. And again, in just this same year, this year, another group of prominent researchers termed loneliness a, quote, lethal behavioral toxin that accounted for more deaths annually than cancer or strokes. Now this is obviously social isolation, social exclusion, loneliness in the world at large. Uh, and this evidence is not uh, just uh, in terms of empirical effects which have been demonstrated. These empirical effects of, of the harmfulness of social isolation and loneliness these empirical effects are grounded in coherent scientific theory. And this too is important to keep in mind when we think about the damage of solitary confinement. There is a theoretical basis for the harm that people who are in solitary confinement suffer. It is the same theoretical basis for the harm that people who are socially isolated or lonely in the free world also suffer. Neurodevelopmental and neurocognitive theories teach us that humans are wired to connect. And that's not just a, a clever metaphor. We are literally wired to connect to others. The neurocognitive and neurodevelopmental pathways um, are, are dependent upon um, our connection to other people in order to be stimulated and in order to function properly. And if we interfere with those connections, we can impair or change brain chemistry, as well as impair or change endocrine, cortisol, and immune responses in human and animal organisms. And the science on this is very clear, as is the theoretical underpinning for the, the empirical data that underscores the damage that is done when people are prevented from connecting, socially connecting with others. In social psychological theory, there is uh, a also well-articulated theories. This is essentially the essence of the discipline of social psychology, beginning with the notion that our identities are deeply grounded in social interaction. 
And this dates back to um, uh, Cooley's Looking Glass Self from the turn of the 20th century, where Cooley argued basically that human beings begin to develop a sense of who they are, of what their own personal identities are, by the nature of the social interactions that they have and the reactions that they perceive other people having to them. Um, and that this development uh, of our identity, which depends on this looking glass self, he said, begins when we're young and it continues through adolescence and even into early adulthood. Social psychologists also know and social psychological theory teaches us that we depend as people on social feedback to help us determine who we are and also what we are feeling. So there are social psychological theories of emotion uh, which underscore the extent to which our emotions are grounded in the social interactions that we have, how we know what we're feeling, how we know to code our emotional responses. All of these things are rooted in social contexts and social interactions. And social psychologists also teach us that human beings possess a well-documented intrinsic need to affiliate, especially in times of stress. Uh, and when that need to affiliate is thwarted or frustrated, then we in, indeed react with uh, anxiety. Um, and we have a much more difficult time managing the stress uh, with which we are confronted. Even our colleagues in anthropology uh, ha understand and have documented and have theorized the extent to which humans survive and thrive collectively and tribally through social connections, networks, associations, and the formation of groups. And in societies or cultures where these things are impaired or interfered with, where there is chaos and anomie in the social connections and social stability that people are able to create, then societies and cultures um, indeed uh, are placed at risk. Now, it, it's important, I, I've been talking so far about social isolation and loneliness and social exclusion in the larger society, but it is important to understand the way in which solitary confinement is an especially toxic form of social isolation and always a form that is imposed in addition to the already toxic environment of prison. So as harmful as social isolation and loneliness and social exclusion is in the world at large, it is delivered in much more focused and extreme doses inside solitary confinement. And there is every reason therefore to believe that the damage which is done is even greater than the damage which is done to people who are living in and experiencing these things in the free world. Solitary confinement is the one place in our society where social isolation and loneliness are at their very worst. They are exacerbated by among other things, geography, Many solitary confinement units are located in inside prisons or in standalone prisons that are geographically remote from uh, uh, other concentrations of people, from cities, um, from the, uh, thwarting the ability of prisoners to connect to, to people outside of the institution, making it difficult for them even to receive visitors from the outside world. Um, solitary confinement exacerbates social license isolation and loneliness through the architecture, both external and internal architecture, which is created. Many of these environments resemble nothing so much as storage, uh, storage containers for inanimate objects. If you look at an environment like this, Pelican Bay State Prison in California, um, th there's no evidence really given from the ex outside that this is a place where real human beings actually live. Um, and many of these facilities uh, are, are structured from the outside looking in in this way. But even more importantly, from the inside looking out, um, they are places whose architecture is designed explicitly and effectively to keep people separate from one another, disconnected from social interaction. Um, and that disconnection and that separation and that isolation is imposed here to a degree that exists nowhere else in society. People who are in these environments live uh, in 60 to 80 square foot areas that basically constitute the parameters of their entire existence. 
some more severe and disheveled than others, but nonetheless, um, places that in the terms of the way in which they are structured require people to be isolated one from another. And that isolation is forcefully imposed. Indeed, there is forceful, pejoratively imposed, degrading rituals of deprivation and control, which exist in solitary confinement units and nowhere else in our society. People are subjected to forms of control and indignities that exist inside solitary confinement units, making the social isolation and the loneliness there so much more severe and worse than in society at large. And of course, people who are subjected to these things suffer. They suffer in part, in large part, because of the added stress and added indignation and added deprivation of solitary confinement. But keep in mind, again, that although these results are well documented, and indeed they are well documented in studies of solitary confinement per se, the well documented negative effects of solitary confinement are always experienced in addition to the already severe pains of imprisonment. That is to say, these are all studies, these and other studies of solitary confinement are studies of the increment or added pain or added suffering and harm over and above the pain and suffering and harm of imprisonment per se. And finally, the adverse effects of solitary confinement are likely to persist, persist after the experience of solitary confinement is over, precisely because they predispose person to a social isolation and loneliness in the world at large. That is to say, solitary confinement, especially when it's experienced on a long-term basis, requires people to adopt forms of adaptation or adjustment that make it difficult for them to reintegrate into a social world once they are released. So they not only come out of an environment like this that is physically depriving and harsh and severe, but in order to survive this environment, oftentimes have to develop habits and ways of being that make it much more difficult for them to relate to and connect to and interact with human beings in social groups once they are released. Especially for people who are in long-term solitary confinement, forms of social pathology oftentimes develop. People move from being uh, or, 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 or missing the presence of other people in their life to finding that they actually become socially anxious around other people. They live for so long in, in an environment of asociality that they become accustomed to it. So that when they are finally placed back in an environment where they are around people, they find that they suffer from social phobias, are no longer comfortable around other human beings and distance themselves from other people. There is a kind of a sense of a derealization or what I've called here ontological insecurity. If we know who we are, based on the interactions that we have with other people. If we're deprived the opportunity to have those interactions, we begin to lose a, a, a grasp or a grip on who we actually are. And indeed in extreme instances on whether we are at all. And many people have said to me that, they, that, that they've been in solitary confinement for so long that they begin, they begin to lose a sense of whether they actually exist in the world, not just who they are in the world, but whether they are actually in the world at all. And again, this sense of derealization or ontological insecurity places a distance between them and other people once they're released from solitary confinement. Of course, solitary confinement brings about a sense of depression, but the longer people are in solitary confinement, the greater the likelihood is that that depression becomes so deep that it really begins to translate into something else. It transforms into what I've called here melancholia, a, a kind of deep joylessness or sense of grief. Um, and it is very difficult to shake once people are released from solitary confinement. And in extreme cases, it turns into a form of what I've labeled here social death. That is that people feel that they are no longer part of the social world and cannot become part of that social world because they have been forced to adjust to a world in, in which there is in, in fact a, 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 an absence of people. <clears throat> 
you know, people who are in solitary confinement are extremely lonely. Um, and in fact, in a study I did some years ago at Pelican Bay, I found that at least as measured on the UCLA loneliness scale, people who were in the security housing unit, the shoe unit here, were as, as lonely or more lonely than any other group on earth. Um, at least in terms of published studies in which the UCLA loneliness scale was used, uh, the Pelican Bay Security Housing Unit prisoners scored as high or higher than any other group where there have been reported scores for the depth of loneliness. And that loneliness oftentimes is carried back out into the free world um, where people uh, are not only lonely, but find that they have a very difficult time connecting to other people. And that, as I said earlier, is a form of social death. And we know from studies that solitary confinement survivors have a very difficult time not only fitting into you know, larger social groups once they're released, but they are also significantly more likely to suffer from PTSD once they are, they are released. And the longer term consequences of solitary confinement are not just consequences in terms of their psychological state, but in fact, we know that solitary confinement survivors are significantly more likely to die from suicide, homicide, or opioid overdose in the first year following their release. And I think that's because the kinds of things that happen to people in solitary confinement are not easy for them to relinquish, um, force on them transformations of self, which, um, uh, depending upon the kinds of experiences that they have when they get out, depending upon whether or not they're allowed to participate in transitional uh, programs in which they're given therapy or treatment um, for the kinds of changes that have taken place in them in solitary confinement uh, are likely to persist, likely to follow them back out into the free world, um, where ironically and sadly, um, they may self-isolate, and then indeed suffer the consequences uh, or effects of solitary confinement as, as it is experienced in the larger world. Um, social isolation, loneliness, um, which we know even in the free world has a profoundly negative effect on people, even those who are not in prison. And so those are the ways in which I think the harmfulness narrative um, needs to be broadened. I think when we think about and talk about and write about solitary confinement, it is important to keep these four larger points uh, in mind uh, and to make sure to the extent we can, um, we advert to them because they are dimensions of this harmfulness um, that I think both broadens and deepens our understanding of the nature and harmfulness of solitary confinement itself. And on that note, I will thank you for your attention uh, and uh, I will uh, be happy to uh, begin to answer questions.